Life is Strange Before the Storm, a prequel to the original Life is Strange has a huge task ahead of it, recreating an experience that was so special when you played through it for the first time. Then, on top of that, creating something new, finding new freedoms and restrictions that weren't there previously. And if Episode 1 Awake is any indication, Deck 9 games are well on their way to making something that is unique to them, yet brings a game that respects the original material. I've played through this episode in its entirety about four times now, trying to find out as much as I can, and I think I have a pretty good grasp on how I feel about this episode. I'll be referencing back to my initial impressions video a few times, mostly because my opinion on episode 1 has for the most part stayed the same. I still think it's a great episode, even with its flaws, which, along with its writing, its choices, its dialogue and its characters, and much, much more I'll be covering in depth and giving my opinion on, but there's something deeper to look into here, with the story of Chloe Price and Rachel Amber. Rachel Amber is still a mystery in Before the Storm, and like a good mystery, giving us even more questions than answers. I've covered Rachel in depth in another video you should check out that covers a lot about who she is, and we see most of that come out in episode 1. Rachel is flirtatious, ambitious, popular, and a Leo. But there are new things we learn about her as well. She's sympathetic, perceptive, explosive, and ambidextrous. While it's great that we're getting more answers to who Rachel is, I like that there is still this mysterious element to her spirit. In Season 1, it felt like Rachel was this larger-than-life person who had some effect on everyone at Blackwell and Arcadia Bay. Without one line of dialogue or even a real appearance in the game, she still felt like her own character. Someone you don't interact with directly, but interact with the consequences from the decisions she's made and the people she's touched. This was merely just great writing and storytelling by Don't Know Entertainment, but I like that Deck Nine was able to present a real, living and breathing Rachel in Before the Storm and still keep that attraction that came with her mystery. As Rachel herself says, life needs a little mystery. But there's more to Rachel than just her person. It's the people she interacts with that have a huge effect on her and the world of Life is Strange. When I was playing Before the Storm, almost everything I knew about Rachel left my mind entirely, specifically the part where she had some sort of relationship with Frank Bowers and is apparently in love with the teacher at Blackwell, Mark Jefferson. Replaying Before the Storm with this knowledge firmly in my mind gives me a different outlook on Rachel. It questions whether anything she says to Chloe about what she feels means anything. However, as I kept replaying it, I kept finding myself disregarding all of this and viewing Rachel in the same way Chloe does. What an indescribably awesome person. I think the fact that I'm starting to like Rachel as a character, even though she's not really the best person, comes down to the excellent writing for her, and I'll get into that soon. I think a big contribution to my doubts about Rachel's dishonesty is the fact that we just don't really know too much about her relationships at this point. Maybe she hasn't met Jefferson yet. It's been stated that he doesn't appear in Before the Storm, but that doesn't mean he's not actually on campus. Maybe she hasn't met Frank yet, but when they run down the stairs at Firewalk, it's unclear whether Frank recognizes both of them or just Chloe. We don't really know. At the moment, I think it's down to your interpretation as to whether Rachel is being genuine or not, and for the purposes of this review, I'm going to assume they are, because if they're not, then that has a lot of implications going into Season 1. So let's not think about that today. There's also an argument to be made that Rachel and Chloe's sudden relationship and interest in each other after only meeting one day before is unrealistic, but I would argue back and say that it is possible, at the very least from Chloe's perspective. Chloe is exposed and is lacking this connection that was broken when Max left. The death of her father is still on her mind and a new father figure is trying to come into her life, someone she despises. In defying all things shitty in her life, Chloe starts acting out and part of this acting out is going to concerts in Shady Mills, where she meets some really shady guys and is almost seriously harmed if it weren't for Rachel. While we don't see what happens afterwards, they do party the night away. Who knows what happened at that party? So combine the bonding experience of saving a stranger's life, 
Those strangers clicking together so well because the writing for them is true to their character, finding that those strangers have experienced a very similar kind of pain to do with losing someone, that their home lives are very rapidly changing for the worst, and then it's no surprise that these two become so attached to each other so quickly. Back in Season 1, Episode 1, in Chloe's room, she mentions to Max that she would laugh at how different Chloe and Rachel were to each other. Which is funny because I don't think even Chloe realised just how similar they were, and how those similarities played a part in bringing them together. Not to say that everything between them is similar. There's a moment between Chloe and Rachel on the train, where Chloe states that she has no friends, to which Rachel claims with certainty that she does. I think this is a great indication of how Chloe and Rachel view people close to them differently. Chloe, who earlier in the episode shares music with the Blackwell security guard, plays Dungeons and Dragons with some classmates, and somewhat agrees to go to the play with Elliot, a guy who she's hung out with before, feels that she's not friends with any of these people. It could be that Chloe views that an actual friendship needs to have something deeper behind it to consider someone a friend. She considered Max a friend, and more importantly her only friend, until she left. Rachel, on the other hand, who has been described as Blackwell royalty, probably considers people she's had 5 minute conversations with to be friends, and I can definitely see that happening, since it did happen, to me. And I honestly think it could happen to anyone if you only had a 5 minute conversation to go by with Rachel. A lot can happen in 5 minutes with this girl. This highlights a stark contrast between Chloe and Rachel. Rachel will become friends with a lot of people so that she doesn't feel alone, while Chloe pushes people away so that she can be alone. Near the end of the episode, there's this great dynamic flip between the two, where Rachel will start to push Chloe away so that she can be alone, and now it's Chloe who doesn't want to be alone. As sad as it is, I really like this, and it showed just how much of an effect these two are having on each other. Now, there is also the whole story about Rachel's father cheating, which I won't cover too in depth since this is something we don't know too much about as well, and we'll probably learn more in the future episodes. While yes, it will probably play an important part in the story, what really is the key focus here is the relationship between Chloe and Rachel, and I'm really keen to see where it goes. What I think is really impressive with Before the Storm that has carried over from Season 1 and the reason we can actually examine things like this comes from the great writing and dialogue between main characters, and I want to put emphasis on the main characters. I mentioned in my first impressions video that the writing just wasn't as great with the minor characters, but we'll get into that. In nearly every scene with Rachel and Chloe, I always felt like I was engaged in the story. I never felt like I was bored or disinterested, and I was constantly wondering what's going to happen next. I also loved just how many emotions Chloe would experience for Rachel throughout the episode. Sometimes Chloe would be nervous and not really know what to say. Sometimes they would have a general conversation between friends. Sometimes it would be a deep talk and they would open up to each other, and sometimes it would be tense. I'm just not really into touchy-feely shit, but I feel like I can trust you. Yeah? I got on this train with you, didn't I? Fair point. I have a feeling that won't be the last intense scene we have with these two, and I'm so hyped. So, that's definitely one of the highlights of the writing for Before the Storm, combining all of these elements to create a really compelling tale of two people bonding and discovering something special. But there are low points for the writing as well. One of the things that really bothered me was Chloe's monologuing. Every now and then Chloe will think something to herself about her next objective to push the players who might be a little stuck, and I get why they have to do this, but I really feel there should be a better way. Her monologuing about her objective is very world-breaking, and is one of the main things that took me out of the experience. They are things a normal person would never think of at all. This sort of thing can be really damaging to the character of Chloe. Deck 9 are trying to showcase Chloe as this real person, going through real pain and experience, and they do a really good job of it, and then completely wash all of that away when Chloe will break character to tell people what they have to do. 
They even solve this problem themselves with Chloe writing on her hand what she has to do, and this mechanic is even addressed by Chloe in the game, which makes it even more grounded and gives an insight into a part of Chloe who wants to stay focused. So I really don't know why this sort of thing remains in Before the Storm. The writing for some of the more minor characters was also something that was carried over from Season 1 in that I either didn't feel that connected with the characters or feel that they weren't as fleshed out as I'd like them to be, or a combination of both. I did not at all enjoy anything that Evan said, he just seemed so stereotypical, and it felt like there was never anything deeper to his character other than just stop fires. It feels like the developers were just trying to foreshadow the whole Rachel starting a forest fire thing and didn't really do anything much else for his character. I also feel the same way for Samantha. Her dialogue just sort of said, hey, I'm weird and shy. She basically just comes out and says this, and that was pretty much it. We do have a more interesting interaction with her when Nathan comes into the picture, and I'll get into that soon, but I would still call the writing for her kind of weak. I do get that the focus of this game is Chloe and Rachel, and you can't really put an entire character's backstory in a 5 minute conversation, but I wish there was something more to these characters rather than just stereotypes. Luckily, this isn't the case for all the minor characters. Another thing I mentioned in my first impressions video was how good the performance of Chloe was in Before the Storm, but what I didn't mention was Rihanna DeVries, the actor voicing Chloe in the game. As I mentioned before, I had my doubts about Rihanna from a few of the previews that were released, but as I played through the episode, it became less of an issue, and I eventually just forgot that there was a different voice actor, so everything was fine. But going back to the original Life is Strange and hearing Ashley Birch's voice again, it became apparent again that they are different voice actors, and then I kind of felt that Rihanna's Chloe was kind of missing the mark. Not in terms of performance, but just in how Chloe sounds. I think as we go through the next two episodes, this is something I'm going to go back and forth on. I'm not saying that Rihanna did a bad job, in fact, there were some scenes where her performance matched that of Ashley Birch, but I guess there's just no replacing the original. However, it is clear that serious work was done with Ashley to give the most authentic young Chloe as possible. You really feel the emotion that Chloe is going through in some of the more intense scenes. And in fact, looking at the credits, Rihanna did do some motion capture work for Before the Storm. One of my pet peeves that I had with Season 1 is that the voice acting and the performance of characters were recorded separately. Sometimes this isn't a big deal, but sometimes there can be a disconnect between the body language of the character and what they're saying. So it's cool to see that Deck 9 are addressing this here. One final thing I want to touch on, I know that before the game came out there was a little issue of Rachel and Chloe sounding very similar, especially at that junkyard scene. You could close your eyes, have it playing, and sometimes you wouldn't be able to tell who was talking. But after playing the game and getting accustomed to their voice, while they do sound similar, they do have very different and distinct ways of speaking. While playing through episode 1, we discover that a lot of other characters have different voice actors as well, which I'm guessing is also down to the voice actor strike. In fact, going back to the credits, we could see that almost every voice actor has been replaced. We knew David and Joyce had different voice actors, but I did warm up to their voices eventually, although not as much as I did with Chloe, they still feel like imposters I guess you could say. One returning character I was really bothered with was Principal Wells. No matter how hard I tried, I just could not get over how different his voice sounded. The dialogue for him was somewhat similar, although he sounds a little bit more bureaucratic than he did in the first game, but maybe there's a reason for that. While he only appears in the whole episode for a little under 5 minutes, and maybe there wasn't enough time to warm up to the voice, I feel that even if he was in for longer, I still wouldn't be able to get used to it, he just sounds that different. There was one character who sounded really, really similar and honestly made me think that their voice actor had actually returned, Victoria Chase. I could tell that she sounded a bit younger, since she is, but I completely thought it was her original voice actor portraying another, much younger Victoria. It was pretty damn good. And just going back to the topic of writing, I really enjoyed the dialogue for Victoria. I think it's one of the better interactions with minor characters since there's two sides to it. 
Victoria presents herself as this nice and well-meaning girl, even though all she can talk about is her achievements, and you can quickly tell that it's actually just Victoria acting. Sometimes her voice will drop down a little lower, and she'll say what she's really thinking, and then she'll very quickly raise her voice again and say a nice compliment. This was really well done by her voice actor and compliments Victoria in season 1 who for the majority of it puts on this act to make herself seem superior and then depending on your choices she'll break this act and show she's really just this young confused teenager. I really wish this depth was shown with a lot of other characters. Anyway that was unfortunately it for similar sounding voice actors, the rest just sort of sounded off. Especially with Nathan Prescott when he shows up halfway through the episode. The voice actor kinda sounds like a young Nathan but it's just not quite there yet. And speaking of Nathan, I guess we should delve into his story. We first see Nathan being terrorised by a bully jockstrap Drew North, who's angry about Nathan joining the football team. So he snatches his art book, threatens him to choose between his weird crap and football, until Chloe steps in to either help Nathan, or watch as Drew terrorises him and throws his art book into the fountain. There's a bit to go into here. Nathan in season 1 was a character that for most of the earlier episodes was the antagonist. He shot and killed Chloe in episode 1. He threatens Max and breaks into her room. He's king of the Vortex Club and due to his wealth and status, untouchable. He seems to be erratic, not in control and either abusing drugs or being prescribed a high volume of them. He's been described as an asshole and a dickbag the asshole. Nathan was also involved with Mark Jefferson and the Darkroom but to what extent is unknown. It's possible he's helped out Jefferson to kidnap and drug girls for his photography. We know that he at the very least supplied the drugs through Frank. We also know that he had something to do with Rachel's death. It's revealed by Jefferson that he gave her an overdose for a photo shoot. Or did he? Check out my video on Rachel if you're interested. So it's clear that Nathan is a bit of a fucked up guy, maybe not through his own choice but from being neglected and taken advantage of. But just like Chloe and Before the Storm, we see a different part of Nathan. In episode 1, Nathan is a part of the same drama production Rachel is involved in, The Tempest. They both appear on the poster for it. It's implied in season 1 that they're both good friends, so it seems that this play could be showcasing how they met or how they're becoming friends. On the school website, it states that he enjoys photography, sports, and the casual hangout with his many friends. In Chloe's diary, she describes many of the same feelings a lot of people have for Nathan and the Prescotts in general in season 1. He's wealthy, he's a bit of a dick, and she feels sorry for him. She states he's really just a weird little dude trying to figure out his shit, but he also has to pretend to be all this stuff he's clearly not, like an athlete or a cool kid. Which gives us two possibilities for Nathan's interaction with Drew, one being that his father has forced him to join the football team because no son of mine will be in a damn drama class. It could be an attempt by his father to force Nathan into being someone he's not, the top jock of the high school football team. Maybe he just wants to do drama and photography, maybe he just wants to do something in some way to express himself, but because of his father he has to do something else. It kinda makes this whole scene a bit tragic if he let Drew throw away his art book. Nathan is being bullied for something that was out of his control, something caused by his father and something that affects another one of his aspirations. Or it could be that Nathan joining the football team was an attempt to try and feel normal, like he's one of the boys and not some rich asshole. If what's written on the school website is true and not just there because his father made it so, then he's just trying to do something he's interested in. Since Chloe thinks he's not an athlete, maybe Nathan understands this as well, making him ask his father to help him get on the football team, and his father just solved this problem like it seems he solves every other problem, by throwing money at it, which led to him buying off the coach. I'm not too sure which theory has more validity, but my money is on the former. So while we do see a different kind of Nathan, the strains on his life in season 1 do appear to be on him here as well. This stigma of just being this rich golden child that leads to everyone hating him, the fact that he can't seem to fit in due to his father forcing him to be someone he's not, and along with the stigma, being looked down upon by his peers, being pitied and punished. 
It kind of gives you a better perspective on why Nathan does some of the things he does in Season 1. I'm not saying they're a valid excuse for what he does, but at the very least there are reasons behind it. There's another aspect of Nathan and his father that gets mentioned by our favourite science teacher Miss Grant, who by the way also has a different voice actor and her dialogue is okayish. She mentions that the Prescotts have made a very substantial donation towards Blackwell Academy, however this donation is being put towards more of the arts side rather than the science and mathematics. In that AMA with Deck 9 before release, Chris Floyd states that we'll be seeing more of how Blackwell Academy transformed from a normal high school to the arts specialised seniors only two year program that we see in season one. We've seen evidence in the past that the Prescotts have had some big role to play with Blackwell Academy, however the fact that Sean Prescott had a hand in completely transforming it is pretty big, and his influence might go to explain certain other things, but I think that may be a topic for another video. The transformation of Blackwell might explain a few other inconsistencies that popped up in Season 1, specifically with people's ages and their grade. Warren Graham in Life is Strange was 16 years old, and Blackwell at that stage had already been transformed into a seniors only school, but since in Before the Storm it's a normal high school, Warren would have been a student there at the young age of 13. You can even see him in this group shot and just out of reach on campus. So between these two timeframes the school was transformed and since Warren was a 4.0 GPA student the school decided to keep him instead of transfer him and put him up a grade to his senior years. This isn't exactly confirmed and was originally a theory back in the day to explain it but at least there's now evidence to back it up. Again we're going to have to wait for episode 2 and 3 to learn more. And we're also going to have to wait for those episodes to learn more about Nathan and his family's dealings with Blackwell. Now, I want to talk about the technical side of Before the Storm, and there are a few things that have been dramatically improved over Season 1, starting off with lip syncing. Holy moly has the lip syncing been improved. I mean, just look at these two comparisons. I bet your respectable family would help me out if I went to them. That place is a hellhole filled with shit, where shitty people go to be shitty to each other and themselves. <laughs> Tell me how you really feel though. This was something that I kind of brushed off with season 1 as something to just ignore because what's important is what they're saying, but it's quite obvious how much of a difference it makes when it looks like those characters are actually saying what they're speaking, giving a lot more believability to what they're expressing. It makes the lip syncing in the first season just look terrible. A huge aspect to this is the facial animations as well, which have also been drastically upgraded and you can really tell how much work was put into making Chloe react more realistically when she's engaged in conversation. Just take a look at this comparison as well. I... I thought so too... before today. But without your power, we wouldn't have found her! Okay, so you're not the goddamn Time Master, but you're Maxine Caulfield! I'm sorry for whatever I did or didn't do. Today was the best day I've had since, since my dad died. You, you could use that photo to change everything right back to when you took that picture. All that would take is for me to, to. I don't want to be alone anymore. Again, there is just no comparison to make. Deck 9 have put a lot of work and a lot of detail behind Chloe's facial animations to make them look more human. Something I really appreciate is the amount of care and detail they've taken with Chloe's eyes, and you can spot a lot of this detail if you pay attention. The way she darts her gaze away when she's being sarcastic, being put on the spot, or trying to hide something, how she very subtly rolls her eyes back when she hears something ridiculous, not just Chloe, but the way characters will animate their eyebrows and foreheads when they want to put emphasis on something they're saying. Conversations are no longer just a series of stock animations for characters to do while they speak. The way they act and respond has been meticulously handcrafted for that conversation. 
All of these things combined goes a huge way to creating a much more realistic and believable character and in the end gives us a much deeper and emotionally connecting story. I think I can safely say that this is one of the improvements Deck 9 have made that is just substantially better in Before the Storm than in Season 1. I guess they weren't lying about that story forge utility they built. Something that didn't really get improved and was ported over from the original Life is Strange is the difference between the lighting and cutscenes compared to gameplay. The garage and the scene in its entirety is a bit dark and a bit muddy, but the moment Chloe walks up to the garage, the scene is transformed dramatically by the lighting. All of a sudden, everything's warm and bathed in these golden rays. Then, as soon as the cutscene ends, it's back to dark and muddy. Season 1 was kind of better at hiding these lighting changes in the cutscenes, but with the use of a special tool, you can jump from cutscene to gameplay and back to cutscene and see just how much of the scene changes with the lighting. I don't have a huge problem with them doing this as long as they hide it well enough that it's impossible to notice without special tools, but this was definitely noticeable and it took me out of the experience a bit. There are also these split milliseconds between cuts where you can see the lighting and some of the character models change and transition into the next scene. I never really used to notice these weird issues but since I'm using a custom camera a lot they are pretty easy to spot once you notice them and I apologise in advance to the people who will now replay Life is Strange and can't stop noticing them everywhere. It's not really a huge annoyance but now that we've both noticed them I think it's time for Deck 9 to fix them. There also seems to be new issues in Before the Storm that never appeared in Season 1, like this weird depth effect glitch that occurred especially when you played on PC on a 4K monitor, which I do. This caused a few of the characters within the cutscenes to be slightly blurred out, unless they moved their heads slightly closer or further away from the camera. It was pretty annoying and you can probably spot this happening through a lot of my footage. Something else that was way more annoying was the fact that sometimes during cutscenes characters would stutter a bit when they're on the screen. This happened quite a bit with Rachel. Originally I thought this was just my FPS or maybe the frame limiter was turning on during certain scenes and limiting my FPS to 30 but after running a frame counter that was not the case. I know I'm going on about these issues that Deck 9 might address and fix in the future, but these sorts of things to me are just as important as the smaller details in the game. When you have a completely seamless and fluid experience without any hiccups or technical dramas, then it does a lot to keep people engaged in the story. What makes the story in Life is Strange and especially Before the Storm unique are the choices. You get to shape the story and the consequences of your actions and decisions will impact the world around you. As it states at the beginning of this episode and similarly through Season 1. Whether your choices actually mean anything in Season 1 is up for debate and I have my own views on these things but for now let's talk about Before the Storm. Since this is only episode 1, we can't say for sure whether your important choices will mean anything until we get to play the last episode. But we can already see a lot of smaller consequences play out from the choices you make in this episode. We can also see that some choices not only just lead to an A or B resolution, but they can also lead to other choices as well. One of the biggest first choices we encounter is stealing the money from the back of the car at the firewalk event. This one action can lead to a number of outcomes that can lead to a number of different states when we enter episode 2. If we don't steal the money, then we don't get the option to buy Pot off Frank and pay off our debt. If we do steal the money, then we get the choice of paying our debt with Frank and purchasing some weed. Going down this route would leave us in a better stance with Frank, who will apparently play a bigger role in Before the Storm, and if we get to see him again, this action might lead to him helping us out. But purchasing the weed also means Chloe has weed on her person, which in turn changes some of the dialogue with a lot of the characters throughout the episode. People will pick up on it and either point it out to Chloe or they'll try and help her mask it. Moving to the end of the episode, Chloe will still have weed on her, and that might have some effect in episode 2. If we go back to the mill and choose to keep the money, we then have the choice later on to slip it into Joyce's purse. Doing this and knowing Joyce, I'm not too sure whether this is good or bad, but I'm leaning more towards Joyce freaking out. After this, there's no other mention from Joyce about the money, so it's assumed we moved into episode 2 with her still having it. 
Then there's also the choice of stealing the money, not buying Pot of Frank, and not leaving it in Joyce's purse. Chloe keeps it for herself. This leaves us still in debt with Frank, but might give us the option to pay it off later. In the short term, it also leaves Chloe weedless. Not giving it to Joyce also means that she has no money, but also less evidence that Chloe snuck out the previous night, leaving Chloe with this huge wad of cash going into episode 2 with Rachel. All of this comes from just one choice, one of the many choices you make in episode 1, that has already led to either better or worse relationships and that changes dialogue. So choices look promising in Before the Storm, but there are some choices that led to the same consequences regardless of what you choose. Take jumping off the train with Rachel. You're given a choice of whether to jump or chicken out. If you choose jump, you jump. If you choose not to, then Rachel just pushes you off. The end result is always the same. You could argue that the real choice here was listening to Rachel. She's the one who tells you to jump and the choice is whether you actually do what she says or not. I think this will have some effect in a future episode, but my guess would be a throwaway comment during an argument. You say you trust me, but you didn't jump, or something like that. This sort of thing also happened earlier in the episode with David and their awkward fist bump. You can choose to leave him hanging or fist bump him, but no matter what you choose, he will always fist bump Chloe. It seems that this is another thing that is meant to shape how their relationship will end up, rather than a short-term consequence, but you're still sort of left feeling, why was there even a choice? To round this off, I still really enjoyed how there was much more depth to most of the choices in Before the Storm, how your decisions would lead to other decisions and how some of those choices would change certain things Chloe would say in the world. It really makes you feel like you're crafting your own experience and that the people around you are reacting to that. We'll have to wait and see until the next few episodes to find out how a lot of those other main choices will play out. Now, I want to touch on the dream sequences in Before the Storm, which follow Chloe in the backseat of her father's car just before the accident that costs his life. I didn't find these too bad, I'm not one for dream sequences, and it does feel like Deck Nine just looked at the original visions Max was having about the storm throughout Season 1, and felt they had to have their own versions of those sequences in Before the Storm. Chloe can't time travel, so dream sequences it was, and they just sort of put them in there. But there are a few things we can learn about Chloe and her state of mind from these dreams. From what I gathered, the dreams are a way of showing that Chloe still thinks of her father constantly, and the circumstances surrounding him on that faithful day. Chloe wasn't actually with him when he died, but it seems she likes to think about what his final moments were like. Chloe has a lot of regrets and a lot of grief for what happened on that day. Back in Season 1, Episode 3, she reveals that sometimes she blames Joyce for William's death just because she wanted a ride home. In the dream, we can actually hear William mumble. It seems that Chloe has been harboring this blame for a long time. There's also a great, yet really sad reflection between Season 1 and Before the Storm here. The anger Chloe feels in this scene that led her to remember the anger for her father was actually brought up by Rachel when we discover a few things about her. The anger Chloe feels in this scene for her father was brought up by Rachel. No matter what Chloe does, it seems that one of the two has a death grip on Chloe's life, haunting her either in the waking world or the dreaming one. In the second dream sequence, we see Rachel standing under the old oak tree that Chloe finds her under later, and we also see that Rachel catches fire. It's almost as if Chloe could see the future in her dreams. Near the end of Awake, Chloe and Rachel are together again under the Oregon white oak tree, where Rachel saw the woman her father met up with. It's a big moment for both Chloe and Rachel, they open up to each other, and we learn more about Rachel's backstory. She has that photo of her and her father from earlier, and asks Chloe for a lighter so she can burn the picture and throw it in a trash can nearby. In a huge display of rage and carelessness, Rachel kicks over the bin and causes flames and sparks to land on the branches, igniting the tree. Rachel then lets out a blood-hurdling scream, followed by huge gusts of wind, pushing the flames further and making the fire brighter and more dangerous. 
She lets out a second scream that causes the wind and the flames to completely engulf the tree and later the rest of the immediate area. It seems that the wind was being controlled by Rachel with each scream. This was an intense scene and caught me a bit by surprise. Currently, the theory is that Rachel has powers that allow her to control the wind. Maybe Rachel was the cause of the storm in Season 1, and could possibly be the cause of Max's power. In that AMA from earlier with Deck 9, Toby Palm, one of the community managers, advises that there are supernatural themes in the game, although they're not related to any superpowers that people might control in Arcadia Bay. In another answer, he advises strange elements will definitely be present in Before the Storm. I guess that kind of explains it, but not really. I think there's a simpler, albeit less exciting reason behind Rachel's wind power, artistic representation. I want to show you a scene from one of my favourite TV shows of all time, Breaking Bad. It's the episode where Jesse shoots heroin with his girlfriend Jane. There's a lot of tension and build up until finally Jane injects his arm and we see Jesse fall back into the bed. We then see Jesse start to rise out of the bed and seemingly float above it, getting higher and higher. It's quite obvious that this is a representation of Jesse getting high off the heroin. I think you could say the same for this scene, Rachel screaming at the fire which seemingly causes a gust of wind to make it bigger is trying to represent Rachel's emotional state, she wants to fuel the flames of her anger, and making this bigger than it really needs to be. Yes, your father cheated, but you don't potentially burn down an entire forest because you're angry. In Breaking Bad, you can see that Jane doesn't take notice that Jesse is levitating in the air just above her, and continues on with her business of shooting heroin because it's not really happening. While Chloe on the other hand does freak out, I would say that her reaction is just the reaction anyone would give if their friend just decided to light up a 400 year old tree. I wouldn't say it was a reaction to Rachel actually making the fire rise with the use of wind powers. If it was Chloe reacting to Rachel's wind powers, then it's not an artistic representation, she actually does have wind powers that Chloe can see. And if she actually has wind powers that Chloe can notice, don't you think Chloe would have mentioned it to Max when Max tells her that she has the power to rewind time? Maybe even just mention it at all? To anyone? Maybe? Anyway, those are my thoughts on it. Unfortunately a little lackluster, but it would explain how Rachel doesn't have powers and reinforces that strange elements theme. Just like how Jesse doesn't actually have the power to levitate, but there are some strange elements in Breaking Bad. There's an entire other side to the supernatural in Life is Strange that ranges from the Native Americans, to nature, to Samuel, and to time travel. However, that's a topic for another day. To finish off this review, I think I should talk about Chloe. I've spoken about her relationship with Rachel a lot, but there's also the relationship between Chloe and the player, which was also one of Before the Storm's high points, and I think something that was a lot better in this game than in Season 1. I really felt for Chloe through a lot of this episode. The pain she has gone through is more than any one person deserves, and you can see a lot of that pain is still fresh. I've already covered three main points in this video that I think are the defining things that lead to Chloe becoming Chloe the Keymaster. Her father being tragically killed when she was still such a young age, and having her mother try to replace him with someone she hates. Her best friend abandoning her when she needed her most. And this wonderful, fantastical person who has just showed up in her life could be lying about having a connection Chloe desperately needs. These three things are core to who Chloe is. As horrible as that may be, it's what defines how she acts and how she treats other people around her. And I think Deck Nine did a great job showcasing this, achieving their goal of normalizing flaws. Looking back at Season 1 after playing Before the Storm, I have this greater understanding for Chloe that I didn't have before. All of a sudden, a lot of the decisions she made had a lot more reason behind them, rather than just her being a moody teenager. Coming back to a more lighter note, I like that we got to see more of Chloe's academic side. It was hinted in Season 1 that Chloe was a lot more intelligent than she led on, and this is explored in Before the Storm. She'll make reference to how she won a science fair, and how William was proud of her that day. 
Her moments of introspection are also very revealing, and showcase that Chloe understands that she can be difficult, and that her actions aren't helping Joyce or the other people around her, and how her reasoning for acting out is on some level a conscious choice, a way to say fuck you to the world which has taken so much from her. Chloe will also write letters to Max that she will never send. It's her way of talking about the events that happened in Before the Storm similar to how Max would write in her diary in Season 1. It's another example of Deck 9 trying to keep the gang core to Life is Strange but changing it in a way that makes it unique to Before the Storm. It's done really well and does a lot to show how Chloe still considers Max a part of her life although she's very angry with herself for feeling this way. She's constantly berating Max, calling her names and shunning her for things in the very same letters she writes to share about what's new in her life. And the fact that she never sends them, I think says something about Max. Max has been completely absent from Chloe's life since the death of her father. She doesn't keep in touch with Chloe at all, even after Chloe reaches out multiple times. This was kind of addressed but glossed over in season 1. There's kind of a discrepancy between what Chloe says and what we actually see in the game, but I would chalk it down to Chloe as overreacting a little. She did have a gun pointed at her earlier that day, and Chloe doesn't hold it over Max's head for long. But it's still pretty depressing when you finally see Chloe's side. You see just how much she's suffering in Before the Storm, and all she wants to do is talk to her best friend that's rejected her. Looking at this text at 2.16am and seeing no reply is just heartbreaking. I can kind of see where Max is coming from. It is difficult to find the right thing to say to someone who is going through a really tough experience, but it is still pretty shitty of her to break off contact entirely and for so long as well. In Max's socially awkward defense, it could be that she just doesn't know how bad Chloe is being affected by losing her father. Those really revealing letters are unsent and Max doesn't know what's going on in Chloe's life, but it still doesn't excuse her for ignoring Chloe. Even considering all of this, my opinion on Max hasn't changed too much, but further developments might change that. Well, now that we've covered a whole lot of episode 1, how does it hold up? Does it bring something new to the table while still respecting the original material? I would say yes. Does it recreate that special feeling you get when you play Life is Strange for the first time? Definitely. Do the flaws of this episode ruin the experience? No. They're still really damn annoying and I do hope they get fixed, however, they don't annoy me enough to overlook what is really an exciting tale of two people trying to find something in each other that they can't seem to find anywhere else. For the time being, at least. I honestly have a hard time scoring games and media in general, and this isn't really a review for people who are deciding to buy the game, so I think I'll just leave it to my words. I loved every minute of Before the Storm, and I'm counting down the minutes between now and when the next episode releases. Until then, the story of Chloe and Rachel will be constantly on my mind, building on the anticipation that this episode excitedly started. This was a brave first attempt at expanding on a world that is beloved by everyone who's been lucky enough to visit. So, Deck 9, show us what you have in store. Thank you so much for watching this really, really long video. If you made it this far and are still listening, again, thank you. You're the kind of person I make these videos for and I plan on making more videos like this. These in-depth looks into everything Life is Strange. We still have two more episodes of Before the Storm to go and then another new entire season of Life is Strange to come. So stay tuned for a lot more content and once again, Thank you so much for watching, I hope you have the best of days today.